the deepest ocean of your heart and let me go. Plunge me deeper, let your living water flow. Jesus flow. On Zion's glorious summit stood a numerous host redeemed by blood. They him their king in strains divine. I heard the song and strove to joy. I heard the song and strove to pray together. Holy Father, we are grateful to be together this morning, whether live and in person or virtually. We are thankful that your church can gather however it gathers. And we are grateful that wherever we are, in this room, downstairs with our kids, down the hall with our babies, in our homes with our families, we are grateful that you are there that you are among us. For where any number of your saints are gathered, you're in their midst. We pray that we would be awed and encouraged and strengthened by your holy presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us in this venue this morning, or if you are connecting virtually, glad you're with us as well. If you're a guest this morning, thanks for coming. I've already met a couple of our visitors, and we're glad you are here. Thank you for coming out. And um, we are just glad you're here. I know for some of us, uh, this is like a date, because we've been at home with our kids, and this is the first Sunday that we've offered a, 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 an event for our children. we got one downstairs, and we've got a nursery. And so some of you are like on a date at church on a Sunday morning, and that sounds like you have an exceptionally boring life. But it's a great place to have that first date in a long time. We're glad you're here, too. And uh, we are taking all kind of precautions with our kids, both down the hall to the nursery and downstairs in our children's area. So we are trying to be 
uh, safe and yet move forward as uh, this virus continues to sort of breed its last gasps among us. Things in Madison County are going much better. Keep wearing those masks, keep washing those hands, keep social distancing, and we're going to get through this. We're glad you're here. This morning, we are going to focus on more on the eternal than on the temporary, more on the ultimate than the urgent, more on the heavenly than the terrestrial, more on the holy than the common. So let's stand, let's sing our praises out loud as hard as we can to our holy God and hear his word as it is read to us. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. 
the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne, around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worship God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne. And unto the land.
Hey, a couple of uh, items before we get into the um, message proper this morning. This afternoon, immediately after our service here, the shepherds and the ministers are going to be meeting uh, for a series. This will not just going to be one Sunday afternoon, it'll be several uh, of conversations among ourselves, a time of prayer and study of scripture and culture um, centered around the, the question of what does racial reconciliation look like in our context, in the context of Twickenham Church and this neighborhood and this city, and this county and this state. Um, so I want you to be praying about that. We'll be having these conversations for weeks to come. Um, we have already indicated uh, uh, in a number of occasions, uh, said that we were adamantly opposed to racism in all its forms, but we want to figure out what racial recon reconciliation looks like in our context. I mean, we're a predominantly white church in a predominantly white neighborhood, so let's talk about what that's going to look like for us here. So be in prayer about that. The other thing that I need to mention to you is that uh, about four years ago, we began praying for uh, a young woman named Farrah Rawlings, and she'd been diagnosed with breast cancer, and uh, for the last several years, she's been battling that as it uh, moved through her body and the different parts of her body, her brain and other places, and yesterday around 8 a.m., uh, Farrah suddenly got better. Uh, she went to be with the Lord, and we are heartbroken over that, and yet we are not going to grieve, as Paul indicated, as others grieve because we know where she has gone and what. We have an inkling, we don't really know, but we have an inkling of what is in store for her and for all who look forward to being with the Lord forever. So we want you to continue to pray for, uh, for Farrah's family, for her husband Wes, her daughters Allison and um, uh, Olivia, and for her mom and dad, Buddy and Carolyn, and for her sisters, uh, Jess, uh, uh, Jennifer and Tiffany, and just the whole family, because they are dealing with that right now. The family will be meeting with Funeral Home this afternoon at 1 o'clock. We don't know the arrangements yet. When we do, we'll send that out to you and let you know, but keep that family in your prayers. In fact, why don't we just pray over that right now as we begin. Father, we, 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 we will confess to you that we do not know why? Uh, you do not always say yes when we pray for healing. Um, but we will also confess to you that you are the sovereign Lord. And even when it is not what we want, we trust the decisions you make. We trust your will. And so we give you praise for taking Pharaoh into yourself. We are thankful for Jesus in whom she put her trust years ago because even as good as Pharaoh was and as sweet as she was, she still needed the salvation that comes only through Jesus Christ and you paved that way for her and we are grateful that our sister, this precious friend and mother and wife and daughter and sister is safe in your arms. And we pray for her family, for her husband and her children, her parents and her sisters, and the friends who have ministered to her so faithfully, that you would bless them with comfort and strength in the days and weeks and years to come. We pray especially for Olivia and Allison as they endure what girls should not have to endure, the early death of a mother. Bless those girls and bless us as their church to surround them and to be their mother in, in the ways that we can. Take care of this family, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. So do you, do you remember, I want you to think back, do you remember the day you were baptized? Do you remember what it was like and what you were feeling? I want you to go back to that day. And if you can't remember that day because you haven't yet been baptized, we really should talk. Uh, Jesus himself submitted to baptism. Jesus told his disciples to baptize. Jesus told his disciples to teach about baptism. 
And so if that's not a part of your story, on our website, there are email addresses and phone numbers. Give us a call. Let's sit down with a cup of coffee, our masks, and social distance, and let's talk about it. Let's open up the Bible and read about it. Uh, my baptism was uh, October 10th, 1969. My dad was the worship leader at that service, although we didn't call him that back in those days. We called him song leaders. Uh, a man named Bill Long was preaching a revival, but we didn't call them that either. We called them gospel meetings. And I, uh, I, I answered the altar call, which is not what we called it. We called it the invitation. Uh, I walked the big aisle. Uh, I came down front and uh, declared my intentions to be baptized, and they took me back into a room, uh, me and another a guy named Barry Kingsley. And boy, did that kid need to be baptized. Mercy. <laughs> they, they took us back into the room, and we changed clothes, and we were baptized. And when I came up out of the water, a man named Skinny Oliver wrapped me up in a towel. And when I was a kid, I never could figure out why they called him Skinny, because he wasn't. And then when I got older, I realized, oh, that's why they call him Skinny, because he wasn't. That's why I call Lincoln Handsome. <laughs> right, good looking? <laughs> so Skinny wrapped me up in this towel, and, and he goes, this is a day you'll, he, the voice was quivering, and he was shaking. He was a big, big man, but he was shaking, and he said, this is a day you'll never forget, and, and I haven't. Do you remember the question they asked you when you were baptized? But they only asked me one question. They said, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And I said, yes, which is a really important question because if, if that's not what your baptism is about, you're just getting wet, right? But they said, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And that's the only question they asked. But that's not all they asked candidates for baptism in one South Asian country. The missionary organization that reports this story doesn't mention the country's name out of safety concerns. The country's predominantly another religion, but Christianity has been making some significant inroads in the past couple of decades, especially among the poor and among tribal peoples. And when someone wants to become a Christian, the missionary sits down with them and as, asks not one question, but seven questions. It's a reality check for what they may encounter if they go public with their faith. Here are those questions. The first one is this. Are you willing to leave home and lose the blessing of your father? And in that culture, that's a really big, that's a big ask. Are you willing to lose the blessing of your father? Question number two. Are you willing to lose your job? That's a big question in any culture. Number three, are you willing to go to the village and those who persecuted you, forgive them and share the love of Christ with them? Because if the Christian faith is about anything, it's about love your enemies. Number four, are you willing to give an offering to the Lord? Number five, are you willing to be beaten rather than to deny your faith? Number six, are you willing to go to prison? Number seven, are you willing to die for Jesus? Now, had they asked me those questions back in 1969, I, honestly, I, I don't know how I would have answered them. And, and seeing those questions that people are asking candidates for the Christian faith now helps me realize that while you and I will sometimes face pressure, to conform to our culture's latest hysterias and whims, to conform, we'll face pressure to conform to our, 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 our culture's um, shifting values to uncritically accept those. To say that we're persecuted, that's a stretch. But, but I don't want to minimize the force that the cultural pressure we do feel can have on us. I mean, when you're the only one in your group who doesn't laugh at that racial insinuation. In fact, if you're the only one who calls it out, if you're the only one that doesn't laugh at that sexually suggestive joke, in fact, if you're the one that says, hey, I got a no-fly zone for those, when you're the only one to befriend the weird kid at school, when you're the one person 
who objects to a company policy that's good for the bottom line but crosses one of God's, when you're sitting in that university lecture and the professor who wields the power of pass-fail over your academic future slams your faith and calls out Christians, that pressure, that cultural pressure and all of those scenarios and many more can feel oppressive. It's like you're in a hostile environment. It's like you're behind enemy lines. It can make you feel vulnerable, alone, make you feel isolated. If that has ever happened to you, or if it's happening now, it's a good thing you're either here this morning or there this morning. Because we're in a series called Not Alone, Finding God in isolation. And we've been looking at some very interesting characters in the Bible who for a variety of reasons wound up spending days and weeks and sometimes even decades in isolation. Um, And yet they discovered something important about God and about themselves in those times of isolation and exile. So this morning we're going to turn to the very last book of the Bible, Revelation. It's also known as the happy hunting ground for religious kooks all over the world because well-intentioned people, me included, have reached some crazy conclusions from time to time from their study of this enigmatic book. And and can we just be real honest about the book of Revelation here? It is one of the most mystifying, not just books of the Bible, one of the most mystifying documents you will ever read. But there is a good reason for that mystery Uh, in their introduction to the New Testament called Anatomy of the New Testament, Spivey and Smith say that the book of Revelation, the letter really of Revelation, is a message of resistance and hope in a time of hardship and persecution. See, Revelation is the kind of book that you write to people, for people who are living on the margins of society, people who are a minority people who lack power, people who are in danger from those who have the power. It's written to people who are living their lives uh, metaphorically underground. And that's why you see all that strange symbolism and metaphor in the book of Revelation, all this business about seven-headed dragons and beasts out of the sea and 666 and apocalyptic horsemen. If John had come right out, John's the human author of the Revelation, It was given to him by Jesus, and he transcribed it. If John had come right out and said that God is going to destroy the Roman Empire because it has persecuted the church and persecuted Jesus, this letter would not have survived. And so instead, he writes, Babylon the Great has fallen. His readers, Christians, knew that he was talking about Rome, but the Romans didn't. See, Revelation is a very seditious book of the Bible. The entire Bible, really, for that matter, is revolutionary. That is, it is something that incites revolution. The Bible is not a safe book. Desmond Tutu said, there is nothing more radical, nothing more revolutionary, nothing more subversive against injustice and oppression than the Bible. He said, if you want to keep people subjugated, the last thing you place in their hands is a Bible. Well, then it ought to be the first thing we turn to. We're in Revelation chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 9. If you think that we're going to cover everything about Revelation this morning, no, we're not. Not even going to come close. Now, the interesting thing, though, is this. John who received the revelation from Jesus, is passing it on to his people virtually. He's using the most advanced communication technology of his day. He's using the Zoom of his day, a written letter, to communicate with people he cares deeply for but is separated from. Does that seem familiar? Here's what he says, uh, Revelation 1, beginning in verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion, which, I, okay, already I, I think is fascinating because he's an apostle. He was best friend. This was, John was Jesus' best friend. 
He's called the beloved one in the Gospels. And yet, even though he's an apostle, even though he has healed the sick, even though he has performed miracles, he has witnessed miracles, he took Jesus' mother into his home to care for her. He still, he doesn't trade on any of that. He doesn't drop the apostle card. He just says, I'm your brother and your companion. In the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. I was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. And then he lists off the seven churches that are located in what is now Turkey. Revelation is the only book in the Bible in which the author tells us the place of writing. John says he was on, the, on Patmos, a small island in the Aegean Sea, about 10 miles long, six miles wide. He was there, he says, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. John was exiled because his preaching perturbed the Romans. Now, why would they be offended at an old Christian apostle? Most scholars think that uh, John was exiled to the island of Patmos. I should say something about that. The Romans didn't have prisons like we have where you go and stay for decades if you've done something really, really bad. You went to a prison in Rome to await trial, and it wasn't a long wait. And then you were either executed or exiled. That was, those were your two options, exile or execution. So most scholars believe that, that, that John uh, was exiled uh, during the reign of the Roman emperor Domitian around 95 AD, toward the end of the first century. Domitian was not the first Roman emperor to claim to be deity, but he was the first to really embrace that Domitian loved him some deification. In fact, he insisted that everybody address him as Lord God Domitian, whether you were in person or in writing, that's, that's how you had to address him. And he encouraged this idea of worshiping the emperor as one of the Roman deities uh, among, among the, the cities. Um, the, in Western, in, in, in rather in Eastern Turkey, uh, what is now, I'm sorry, what is now Western Turkey in cities like Ephesus and Pergamum and Laodicea, that cult of emperor worship was really strong because those cities wanted to curry favor with the federal government. And one of the ways you did that was to set up temples and shrines to the emperor. And so he would like, oh, they're, they really love me. I'll send them some money. I'll send them some support. And so back in those days, in the, toward the end of the first century, uh, if you wanted to participate in the economic, the political, and the social life of the community, you had to offer incense and bend your knee to the emperor as to a god. Now, the Romans didn't care if you wanted to worship your god too. In fact, they were, they were good with that. But to ensure social cohesion and loyalty to empire... You had to, in their words, conform to the Roman rites. You had to worship Caesar. Failure to do so meant that you were ungrateful for all that Rome had given you. Failure to do so meant that you were unpatriotic. And that was a problem for Christians because they recognized only one God and only one king, Jesus. Offering worship to Caesar was out of the question for them. In other words, and this is going to, this is going to rub some of us the wrong way, but one of my jobs is to make you uncomfortable when you're comfortable, so here we go. Christians were a little bit like late first century Colin Kaepernick's, except that instead of refusing to stand for the national anthem, they refused to bow to the emperor. And if it makes you a little uncomfortable that I'm saying that Christians were like first century Colin Kaepernick's, then you have some idea about how the Romans felt about Christians. They were a little more than uncomfortable. It made their jaw tight. It made them mad. Now, at this point in history, widespread empire-wide persecution wasn't happening. There were, there were local outbreaks. Uh, pressure to conform was really strong. Uh, in chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, we learned that a man named Antipas in the city of Pergamum was martyred for his faith, but that was kind of a local thing. And it's likely that John was exiled by a governor, not, not an emperor. 
But a part of the message of Revelation, and I'm going to unpack three things for you here this morning real quickly. A part of the message of Revelation is that things are bad now, but they're going to get brutal. Things are bad now, but they're going to get a lot worse, Christians, before they get better. And John's prophecy about that was dead on. In 250 AD, the emperor Decius issued an edict requiring everybody in the empire to offer a sacrifice to Caesar in the presence of a magistrate. And when you did that, you got a certificate. And, and they, these certificates, have, uh, there are archaeologists who've, who've discovered these certificates, and they, they exist to this day. You can read them, and they, they'll say things like, I so-and-so, the magistrate of this district, witnessed this person offer a sacrifice to Caesar. And if you did that, you got that certificate, and you were good to go. If you didn't, you were executed, and thousands of Christians died. In the year 257, the emperor Valerian ordered all Christian clergy to publicly perform sacrifices to the gods and to Caesar and forbade Christian meetings. He ordered that any Roman senator who had become a Christian, which is interesting that Roman senators had become Christians. He ordered that if a Roman senator had become a Christian, their property was to be confiscated, their, their, their seat in the Senate was to be revoked, and if they refused to renounce their Christianity, they were to be executed. One of the Christians who was uh, martyred during Valerian's reign was a man named Cyprian. Cyprian was Bishop of Carthage, what is now Tunisia in northern Africa. The magistrate in charge of Cyprian's trial was a man named Galerius Maximus. And the transcript of that trial has been preserved. That trial took place on September 14th, 258. Here's, here's how it went. Galerius, the, the magistrate said, are you Thasius Cyprianus? Cyprius said, Cyprian said, I am. Galerius said, the most sacred emperors have commanded you to conform to the Roman writes, Cyprian said, I refuse. Galerius, take heed for yourself, Cyprius. Cyprian said, do as you must. In so clear a case, I may not take heed. And the Galerius said this, the magistrate, you have long lived an irreligious life. That's what he's saying to a Christian leader. You have long lived an irreligious life and have drawn together a number of men bound by an unlawful association, Christianity, and professed yourself an open enemy to the gods and the religion of Rome. And the pious, most sacred, and august emperors have endeavored in vain to bring you back to conformity with their religious observances, whereas, therefore, you have been apprehended as a principal and ringleader in these infamous crimes. You shall be made an example to those you have wickedly associated with you. The authority of the law shall be ratified in your blood. It is the sentence of this court that Theseus Cyprianus be executed with the sword. And Cyprian said, thanks be to God. In the Revelation, that's the kind of opposition John from his island of isolation said was coming. And that's the kind of faith that was going to be required. Kind of reminds you of those questions the missionaries asked the converts in that South Asian country. And so you'd think John is mostly concerned with how to resist persecution and the cultural pressure to perform. And he is concerned about that, but he's concerned about something else. Persecution, he says, is coming and it's going to be brutal. But and here's the second big theme I want to highlight for you. We have as much to fear from prosperity as we do persecution. You see, you and I, we hear a lot about pressure to conform and persecution and how the culture kind of makes it hard to be a Christian these days, John wants to say, yeah, that's true, but you need to be more afraid of prosperity than persecution. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus, through John, addresses a church in a city called Laodicea, and here's a part of what he says in verse, 15, he's, uh, verse 17. He says, you say, Christians, you say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, and I don't need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Laodicea, the city, was like the Swiss bankers of the ancient world. It was a financial center. The, the city was rich. The people were rich. The church was rich. It was so rich that when an earthquake leveled the city in 62 AD, 
They turned down Rome's offer of federal disaster assistance. They rebuilt the city on their own. They were really proud of their self-reliance. Their wealth meant that they could pretty much take care of themselves, and the church was like the city. And it's a powerful warning for us. Because if having lots of resources at your disposal is a thing for you and for me and for us, it can lure us into a trap of self-reliance. That's what it did to them, and it can do the same to us. Look, it's no accident that Jesus found his most willing followers among the poor. His first disciples were common day laborers. The lower socioeconomic class was always more willing to follow Jesus. He did have some wealthy disciples, but they were exceptions. Why? Because if you have resources at your disposal, you become accustomed to getting your way. This is us. When we have resources, we're accustomed to getting our way. You become accustomed to control. You become proficient really good at taking care of yourself and getting your way and being in control and self-sufficiency are enemies of the kingdom of God, which is exactly why Jesus said, it's hard for the rich to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's hard to make God the ruler of your life, which is what kingdom means if you are accustomed to being the king and queen of your own little kingdom. Here's a counterintuitive truth. The more resources that you and I have, the more power that you and I have, the more money that you and I have, the more we need God because resources, power, and money are the very things that can compromise our souls and make us think that we don't need God. So here's the other thing that Jesus revealed to John when he was isolated on that island. The first one was persecution is coming and it's going to be brutal. The second one was, even though persecution is going to come, there's going to have all this pressure from culture, you have more to fear from prosperity than persecution. And the third thing he wanted to say to them was, human power cannot restore a broken world. Nobody can deny that our world is broken. Things are just broken right now. All of us, Democrats, Republicans, capitalists, socialists, communists, and anarchists, We all agree the world is broken. The nature of that brokenness and how to repair it, those are the sources of our disagreement. This past week, the Democrats held their virtual convention arguing that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have the answer. Well, next week, the Republicans will hold theirs and they'll argue that Donald Trump and Mike Pence know how to fix what's broken. They're both wrong. Human beings and human movements always assume that if their group gains power, things will at least improve, if not improve exponentially. Just put power in the right human hands and all will be made well. And if you don't think we believe that, listen to our slogans, our political slogans through the years. Republicans have told us it's morning again in America. Heal, restore, revive, make America great again. Democrats have told us, yes, we can. We are the change we've been waiting for. Restore the soul of the nation. And then we buy into that and we jump on social media and we say horrible things to and about each other because we have been deceived into believing the lie that the secret to making the world right again depends upon human power and human potential. And that lie is as old as the Garden of Eden. That's the original lie. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And then after we slam one another on social media about our politics, then we say something about Jesus. If you're going to go on social media and be mean politically. Leave Jesus out of it. He's not a part of that. Here's what Jesus revealed to John about who really has power to restore and heal and revive and make the world great. Revelation chapter 5, we'll hear more of this in just a few minutes. I'm just going to read you one verse, two verses. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain And with your blood, and listen to this, what's 
What's the, the major conversation right now? All this division, right? Listen to this. With your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. In a, in a, few, minutes, a few minutes ago, you heard Revelation 7, 9, and 10. We already listened, heard this one. Hear it again. After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation and tribe and people and language. All of them together, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they were wearing white robes and holding branches and palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation, making everything right, belongs to God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. We sang those words a few minutes ago. We heard those words read to us a few minutes ago. And when we say that salvation belongs to God, we are confessing that it doesn't belong to anybody else, not to either party or any party or any nation. It belongs to God. Look, I'm not telling you that your vote this, this November doesn't matter. I am telling you that Donald Trump is not your savior and neither is Joe Biden. And if you'd pardon my cynicism, most politicians will lie to get your vote and none of them are willing to die for your soul. Jesus did not climb a political ladder when he walked up the hill of Calvary. He climbed a cross. And all the tombs in Washington, D.C. are occupied. The one where they buried Jesus isn't. We do something here and in our homes every week that is cosmically more important than what happens in Washington or Montgomery or any other capital. We remember. We go back to that place and that time when the lamb was slain, when Jesus died on the cross to make a way for us to be healed and whole and forgiven. We go back and remember that because human power cannot restore the world. Only God can. Only that did. That's why these next couple of minutes, when we go back to remember with bread and wine, the body and blood, that's why these next couple of moments are really, really important. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus led and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree, his body. Let's bow together and pray for this bread that we're about to share. Holy Father, we've read the end of the book, and Team Jesus wins. But what a price had to be paid for that victory. A hill, a cross, nails, a crown of thorns, a spear, a body broken, blood shed. And the greatest sacrifice of all, that separation, that moment when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That moment when he, for the first time in eternity, was separated from you. 
And both you and he and the Spirit suffered that rift so that we could be united to you, to him, to the Spirit, and to one another. Oh God, forgive us for ever assuming that anything on this earth can heal, restore, and make whole other than that. Thank you for this bread that we're about to share, this reminder. In Jesus' name, amen. nothing but praise you, when we will sing and pray and worship and be free from all of this. And yet more than that, God, as we take this cup, we are reminded that we are free from all of this now. We are free here. We live differently because of what you've done. And we put our hope in you and not in the things of this world. Bless us as we share this cup. In Jesus' name, amen. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down 
before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Would you stand? Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves so much for being here today. Um, I need to say that we call Jody funny, because he isn't. And I need to say three other things. Number one, if you're a parent of a teenager, anybody in the youth group, you have a parents meeting as soon as we conclude downstairs in the youth area, so please join us for that. Um, Number two, there's a shower today for Clark Dowdy. That's a drive-by shower at the Mercy Building down on the corner. Um, please note that. That's from 1 to 2.30. And thirdly, Wednesday, 
We were supposed to have another picnic prayer and praise, and we may, and we may not, um, depending on a couple of things. One would be the funeral arrangements that may be forthcoming this week. And then secondly, there's a little thing out in the Gulf that's headed this way, so we could get rained out. However, we already ordered Chick-fil-A for everybody, and you can still get an order in, and we will still have it, because we're already on the line for that. So even if it rains, we're going to have drive-by pick up your Chick-fil-A night. <laughs> you can pull through and grab dinner, because we've already got it coming. So keep all of those in mind. Wow. Hope you have a great week. I really do. I really, really do. May the amazing grace of Jesus bless you and give you peace. Have a great day.